My name's Dr. Jeff Foster and I am a GP with a specialist interest in men's health. Today we're going to be talking about prostate disease. When we talk about men's health, there are certain common similar themes that we see each year that we're asked to talk about time and time again. The more common problems tend to be things like mental health problems in men, testicular disease, cardiovascular problems, which are still the leading cause of death in men, testosterone if we're lucky, and perhaps most commonly prostates and prostate disease. And the interesting thing about prostates is that most guys have heard of a prostate, but not many of us actually know what it really does or what we have to worry about. So the prostate is actually a walnut sized gland that doesn't really do anything until puberty. But after that, when we're sexually active, the prostate is responsible for assisting in sexual function. So it helps transport semen and sperm, and it also helps with ejaculation and normal sexual function. The big problem with the prostate, however, is the urethra, the tube that we pee out of, runs right through the middle of it. The other big problem is that the prostate gland is very, very sensitive to testosterone. Well, maybe not testosterone directly, but one of its byproducts, dihydrotestosterone. And it has loads of these little receptors on. And the problem with the prostate is it has a cumulative effect so that over time, as we get older and we have more testosterone, it fills up these receptors and the prostate continues to grow year by year. So the problem is that over time, as the prostate continues to get bigger with age, at some point it's going to start to squeeze the urethra, which means it's going to become harder and harder to pee, and your flow is going to go down simply as you get older. My son, who's uh, 11 now, uh, last year I think we were at a, an Indian restaurant, and the two of us were standing peeing at a urinal, and he's there peeing with this absolute jet flow of power as he watches his urine flies above his own head, Meanwhile, I look down and see this dribble of urinary function. And it's something that you don't really notice because, of course, as a guy, your urine flow just gradually declines slowly over time. It's not a sudden event. So you don't realize how the urethra is being squeezed over time. Now, this isn't a disease process. This is just your natural prostate getting larger as we age. At some point, of course, that could severely impact on your ability to function. And in that case, that's a benign large prostate, in which case we need to tackle and treat that. In terms of things that can go wrong to the prostate, well, it's actually quite a simple organ and there's only three things that can really go wrong. It can become cancerous, which is what most guys worry about. It can just get larger and squeeze in our ability to pass urine, which is kind of what we touched on, or it can get inflamed or infected. So starting with prostatitis, because that's probably the most common cause we think of infection or inflammatory causes, prostatitis simply means an inflammation or infection of the prostate. The more common causes tend to be due to either urinary tract infections or sexually transmitted diseases. But as the prostate gets inflamed and infected, it becomes very, very painful. It can hurt to pass water. You might notice a tenderness in your perineum, which is the gap between your testicles and your anus, so right in the middle. Um, that can become extremely sore and you can get temperatures, you can get fevers, you might feel really unwell. Luckily, prostatitis is quite an easy condition to treat. And once you've got it diagnosed, we usually give you antibiotics and most guys get better quite quickly. What I should mention, however, is that whilst prostatitis is relatively common and easy to fix, urinary tract infections in men should not be treated in the same way as they do for women. So it's relatively accepted that a lot of women can get urinary tract infections and that's a pretty normal ish sort of scenario because women have a short urethra so the distance between the external world and their bladder is much shorter so bugs can get in there more easily for guys we have a much longer tube that goes all the way around so if you do get a urinary tract infection as a guy it's really important to know why you got it and if not you should be asking your doc why and getting that checked but that's kind of a side issue relating to prostate in a sort of indirect way so Outside of um, an infected prostate, so prostatitis, the other conditions we can also get are a benign prostatic hyperplasia, which is simply the growth of the prostate that I discussed as we get older. So classic symptoms of BPH, benign prostatic hyperplasia, are tend to be a reduction in flow. So as we talked about, there's simply the fact that the tube is getting more narrow. Other symptoms of BPH include hesitancy, so the difficulty starting or difficulty stopping, dribbling afterwards, or feeling of incomplete emptying, like you could go again a few minutes later later and of course things like simple nocturia the idea that you're having to get up more times at night to pee now not all of these symptoms are related to a benign large prostate but these are the more common symptoms and they tend to gradually occur over time gradually get worse until the point where it really impacts on your life 
it takes many years to develop BPH. So it's not something you're suddenly going to develop over a weekend. And the idea is that with BPH, this is not necessarily a disease process, as I said before, but it's a natural growth of your prostate as you age. So you only really need to treat it when it becomes a problem. Provided you rule out other causes like cancer or diabetes or infections or anything else, then actually a large prostate is something that impacts on your quality of life. And then we look at treatment options. So in terms of treating a large or benign large prostate, well, there aren't really any great tablets. And there are a couple. So the drug called tamsulosin or similar drugs in that family, these are called alpha blockers. And they simply work by relaxing the bladder neck so you can pee better and pass urine more easily. But of course, the problem with that is it symptomatically improves. But in the meantime, that prostate is still growing and growing in size. There is another treatment called finasteride, which is a tablet, and the finasteride tablet acts to help shrink the prostate over time because it blocks the receptors and that conversion of dihydrotestosterone so the prostate literally starts to shrink back down. The problem with this is that sometimes patients get side effects of taking the tablet, and side effects can include sexual dysfunctions or even retrograde ejaculations, therefore you stop ejaculating externally. Some guys, because you're blocking part of that testosterone pathway, can feel quite unwell, lethargic, and almost, almost like a menopausal, perimenopausal picture that women might get. Now, I'm not saying that every guy will get this with finasteride, but it's something just to think about before thinking that a tablet is an easy way to avoid having to have surgery. When we are thinking about surgical options, and that is an option for a lot of guys with BPH, actually developments and treatments in terms of prostate treatments have changed rapidly in the last five or ten years. Now we used to do a procedure called a TURP, which is a transurethral reception of the prostate, and this kind of involved getting a corkscrew effect and boring it through your prostate which unsurprisingly was quite bloody, quite unpleasant, quite painful, and meant you had a catheter up there for a day or two. Now, no one really wants to do that if they don't have to. Recent treatments have been far, far more advanced, and they involve things such as uh, either a steam method, where you can steam the urethra larger, so it doesn't involve bleeding, green light lasers, which also blast the way through the prostate, that mean there's no bleeding, there's no stitches, um, successfully is really good at these. There's even a device which hooks up the side of the prostate and pulls it tight away from the urethra, again, minimizing any bleeding, minimizing any excisions, and a lot, lot easier recovery and faster recovery for patients. If you decide to go down that surgical route, the key is you want to speak to your surgeon who's going to give you the best choices of treatment based on your individual risk, obviously. I suppose the big one we also always think about is prostate cancer. And when we talk about prostate disease, it's what everyone really starts to worry about. It's in the back of your mind. The thing to think about prostate cancer, however, is that if you live long enough, you will get it. And in a way that, in a way that sounds very daunting, but actually it's a real problem of being a guy. So it's estimated that if you live to 90, 99% of blokes will have some cancerous prostate cells sitting in there. But that doesn't mean you have to do anything with them. And the point is that even if you have a few cancerous cells sitting in your prostate, they may never do anything for the next 5, 10 or 20 years. And if you make it to 110, well, then you've done well anyway. So it's not such a big deal. So the real challenge is how do we diagnose prostate cancer that could really impact on quality of life or kill people that might affect younger men and might cause other issues early on? Well, we classically think of prostate screening as a two-stage process. You go to your doctor, you go, I want to have my prostate checked. And the next thing you know, he's getting a set of gloves on, telling you to bend over and checking your prostate with a finger. The other thing we talk about is doing a PSA, which is a prostate-specific antigen test. Now, I should point out that if you decide to go to your doctor, you do not necessarily have to have a rectal examination. Now, this is part of a screening process, but not for everybody. Now, I should point out that doing a rectal exam is not required for every prostate screening process. If you have symptoms, it can be very useful. But as a sort of general screening process, putting your finger up a guy's backside and trying to feel around may not be the best investigative option. The PSA, the prostate specific antigen, as you may have noticed, doesn't actually exist as a national screening tool in the NHS. So bizarrely, despite medicine being run by men for hundreds, if not thousands of years, we haven't actually done very well looking after our own health. So we have cervical screening for women, we have breast cancer screening, but there isn't prostate cancer screening. And that's because the PSA itself is just not good enough as a test to be used as a national screening tool to check for prostate disease. So the problem with the prostate specific antigen test, the PSA, is it naturally grows and gets bigger 
as we get older. So as your prostate grows with age, the PSA gets bigger as well. And the difficulty can be that how do we know the large number that we're getting from having a big prostate is age versus something that could be cancerous. The other difficulty is how do you know uh, if you've got a very low level, is that because your prostate is completely safe or is it because you've got a very aggressive cancer that's completely destroyed your prostate and therefore you've got no PSA to release. In terms of symptoms of prostate cancer, the best way to think about it is really very similar to benign prostate disease. So decreased flow, difficulty uh, starting, difficulty stopping, you might get dribbling, you might find that you're going more often at night and you might have hesitancy, uh, which I kind of just mentioned a second ago, but still in there. Um, but the difference is it should be the sudden onset. So whereas you might find BPH occurs over many, many, many years, usually if it's cancerous, you might find that the symptoms come on more quickly, but they don't have to. The other thing you might notice are secondary symptoms, so bone or pelvic pain or passing blood. Now, of course, if you're getting those, that's a much more worrisome sign, but we should always get those checked. So if you just said to yourself, I want to get myself screened, I haven't got any of those symptoms yet, but how do I make sure I'm okay? Can't I just get a PSA done at the dock? Well, my old boss, who was a, a very renowned urologist, always said to me that we're very good at catching the kitten cancers, the ones that will grow very slowly with a nice relaxed PSA climb over many decades that we can watch and wait and don't have to treat but we're not very good at treating the tiger cancers, the ones that will kill you, because those are the ones that obliterate the prostate, give you a low PSA, and if you're screening for that, well, you may not have any symptoms and the PSA looks normal, so we've just told you that everything's okay. And that's the reason why PSA is not used as a national screening tool. However, I say that, unfortunately, it's also the best thing we've got. So we're now in a kind of trap situation where we have a less than perfect test that we can't use as a national NHS tool, but something that is still relatively useful if used in the right way. So what you might want to do is say, maybe from the age of 40, 45, decide to get maybe a once a year PSA test. And you may have to do this privately because it may not be available as because it's not an NHS screening tool, but at least that way you may be able to catch trends or changes in your PSA over time. I'm not saying this is the best option, but this may be the best thing we have in terms of the available technology. If you do get an abnormal PSA, we used to have to do a biopsy. So it was the case of having an incision made and a large metal rod punctured into your prostate at several points to try and find out whether or not any of these cells were cancerous. And it was a bit kind of random, so quite an unpleasant procedure. Luckily, in the last couple of years, one of the big developments has been the development of MRI scanning with contrast. So we can now inject a dye, which goes into your prostate, you take a scan and you can see any hot spots that might actually be cancerous. If they're completely clear, then your raised PSA is age related and that's great, or it's inflammatory and infected, but it's not cancerous. And if you do find any hot spots, then actually you can do a guided biopsy rather than just having to randomly guess and hope that you hit the right spot. Now that has been a major game changer in reducing the amounts of unnecessary biopsies for men, which is a really, really good positive step. In terms of treatment for prostate cancer, well, the whole point is it's about catching things early. And the earlier you do catch a prostate cancer, the better the outcome is gonna be. If you catch a prostate cancer that's really early, so it's in the first few stages, actually, we often don't treat it at all. And for these guys, this is the idea of watchful waiting, whereby you might have serial PSAs and scans to check every so often if the PSA has changed and the prostate has grown. You don't always necessarily have to have invasive surgery. If you do decide to get on that route, and again, this will be the discussion you would have with your urologist, perhaps oncologist, depending. Treatment options include chemotherapy, radiotherapy, or radical prostatectomy, where they take the whole thing out. Overall, however, there are certain things that we should be focusing more on in terms of prostate and less in terms of worrying if we get the disease. I think we do spend a lot of time thinking to ourselves, how can I screen for prostate? How can I make sure treatment's really good? But we should also spend as equal amount of time, if not more, on putting effort into the population to say, how can I reduce my chances of getting prostate disease to start with? So prostates are remarkably sensitive to uh, carcinogens and cancer risk factors. For example, we know that smoking massively increases your prostate cancer risk. We know that being overweight significantly increases your prostate cancer risk. And we also know that alcohol also increases your prostate cancer risk. Um, 
Interestingly, diets that are very high in calcium have been shown to have some increased risk of prostate disease, but we're talking majorly large amounts of calcium, so you know, a couple of pints of milk a day. Most adults are not really taking this. There's also some studies suggesting that the more sexually active you are, this also reduces the risk of prostate disease. Now, interestingly, the study doesn't really show how often you need to be sexually active, rather than just more, the more sexually active you are, the better the reduction in prostate cancer risk. Um, which is quite great for some guys who've been desperately keen to ask me for certificates that they can give to their loved one to share. Um, always available, obviously. Um, so overall, I think the best take home message for prostates are that it's something that we need to try and reduce the risk of. Screening is getting better, but we're not quite there yet. Treatments are certainly improving and the outcomes of most patients are getting better, but we need to try to do more ourselves to reduce our risk of getting prostate cancer as we get older. Um, I hope that answers some of the questions around prostate disease and um, thank you very much.